Okay, I'm I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled to be here with uh, with Abbott. I love her books. I love all of her books. Um, in in Sin in the Second City, you know, which I which I love. You take us and, and show us this entire other view of of Chicago through the eyes of the two most famous American madams ever. Uh, in American Rose, we learn about this American icon, Gypsy Rose Lee, who really you know, hasn't been explored the way that you explored her. So now, with uh, Liar Temptress Soldier Spy, you hit on several things that I personally adore. Uh, we have unexplored American history, espionage, and women <laughs> with some real spines, really adventurous, incredible women. Tell us a little bit about what this book is about. Well, I, I'll tell you the origins of this book um, to get in there. I I'm, was born and raised in Philadelphia and moved to Atlanta in 2001 and noticed immediately um, that the Civil War seeps in the conversation down in the South in a way it never does in the North. Um, you know, I saw the occasional Confederate flag on the lawn, uh, heard the jokes about the War of Northern Aggression, and uh, the, the point was really Those driven. Jokes. Oh. <laughs> As I, as I learned, <laughs> good point. <laughs> um, yeah, and the point was driven home, especially that it wasn't a joke. Um, when I was stuck in traffic in uh, on 400 for hours behind a pickup truck that had a bumper sticker that said, "Don't blame me. I voted for Jeff Davis." Um, <laughs> So I sat there uh, looking at this bumper sticker for hours and started thinking, of course, about what, what were the women doing, uh, as my mind always goes to what the women were doing. And of course, they didn't have um, easy access to political discourse. They didn't have the right to vote. Um, they couldn't influence battles. So I, I wanted to see what the women were doing. And, and uh, I wanted to find, in particular, four women who you know, cheated, lied, stole, murdered, drank, shot, fought, avenged, and flirted their way through the war. So <laughs> These are women I want to spend time with, oh, which yeah. is why I love this book so much. <laughs> and you know, as authors, we often talk about and are often asked how we find our stories. I have to say, found it on a bumper sticker. Has it come up <laughs> yeah. for me quite often? Um, so once you got intrigued, once that little seed was planted, how did you come across these four incredible women? Well, I wanted to find four in particular whose stories touched in some way, um, whose tapestry wove to um, retell the story of the Civil War in a way it hadn't really been told before. And it was important to me that um, even if they weren't physically interacting all of the time, although two of the women do, Bell and Rose, the two Confederate spies, Bell sort of idolized the older Confederate spy, um, they were running into the same people, um, and there was a cause and effect. Uh, one woman's behavior would affect the other woman's circumstances. And, and I just wanted to sort of uh, weave their stories together in a, in a really interesting way. The, um, one of the things I, I like best about this is there are these four very distinct characters they each have their own background, their own experience, their own views on this particular conflict, and they offer the reader a specific view and entry point into the Civil War. Because, you know, spoiler alert, you know, here's how the war ends. You know, we know where this is going. <laughs> right. But, but one of the, what I like about this is we know where we're headed, but this to me is a really personal way to look at not just this war, but war in general, how people become involved, what roles they take on, how it affects their lives. And these four characters are so distinct and different. Talk a little bit about the four women who carry this book. Yeah, um, and with apologies to John Le Carre. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I think all the women at different points, and at the, often at the same time, were liars, temptresses, soldiers, and spies. Um, and the first is Belle Boyd, who provided a lot of comic relief and, and was actually my favorite in a lot of ways because she was insane. Uh, this was Bell, no, Belle's, Belle's crazy. Yeah, she she's, was she's lovably she, crazy. But she's yeah. Um, Denise and I were talking um, before we went on, and we said she was like a sociopath on spring break, like all the time. Um, <laughs> that girl, if anybody remembers spring break, you're like, she's having a really good time, but there's something just off about yes. her. <laughs> That's Belle, yes. Yes, and, and applying this to the Civil War made for some pretty dangerous circumstances. Um, but Belle Boyd was 17 years old when the war broke out, and she was a Confederate sympathizer living in the Shenandoah Valley, Virginia. 
And um, I will just say that she's all id. She had no filter. Um, if, if Sarah Palin and Miley Cyrus had a 19th century baby, I think it would have been Belle Boyd. Um, she had no, she was very overt with both her opinions and her sexuality. It makes you want to see if there are any pictures of Belle going, you know. <laughs> no, I'm sure there are, yeah. actually. And um, she wrote this great letter to her cousin um, that, that sort of sums up how she felt about herself. Um, and, and Which was what she thought about most of the time. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, I'll just read a tiny snippet of, snippet of that. I am tall, she once boasted to her cousin, lobbying him to find her a husband. I weigh 106 and a half pounds. My form is beautiful. My eyes are of a dark blue and so expressive. My hair of a rich brown and I think I tie it up nicely. My neck and arms are beautiful and my foot is perfect. <laughs> Only wear size two and a half shoes. My teeth the same pearly whiteness, I think perhaps a little whiter. <laughs> Nose quite as large as ever, neither Grecian nor Roman, but beautifully shaped, and indeed, I am decidedly the most beautiful of all of your cousins. <laughs> so that's Belle for you. Um, and she kicks things off soon after that uh, letter was written um, on the 4th of July of 1861. Um, uh, by shooting a Confederate, uh, excuse me, a Union soldier who threatens to ra uh, raise a flag over her home, and, and Bell was not standing for that. So, in addition to, in addition to wanting a husband that she's yeah. trying to get, you know, via, you know, some sort of agreement with her cousin, um, what does what does Bell want in this story? What does this particular character want in this story? I think Bell grew, uh, you know, woke up every day wanting something different, but all of it pointed to uh, what can I do to advance my position and make myself more famous, um, which of course was a, a, a strange attitude for somebody who purported to be a spy to have. You know, this is somebody who, after she shoots the Union soldier dead, um, goes to work as a courier and spy for the Confederate Army. Um, but while she's really earnestly trying to help the Confederate Army and, and gather and disseminate information that might be helpful in their battles, she's also trying to do whatever she can to bring attention to herself. So. She ends up getting attention from a very prominent individual. Yeah. Yeah, Bell was quite obsessed with uh, General Stonewall Jackson, um, who was sort of my Confederate boyfriend, my Civil War boyfriend. If I Don't had we one. all have one? Yes. On, let's just admit that right now. <laughs> um, and Stonewall Jackson uh, was an interesting character. He was sort of a rock star of the Civil War. Uh, and there was a great story about him. Um, he was in the lobby of a hotel. This is in 1862. And, and women just swarmed uh, him. They, they ran after him down the street. If he was in the lobby of the hotel, as in this instance, they just uh, followed him and ran in there and started ripping buttons off his coat and keeping <laughs> souvenirs. And Stonewall was, was great about this. He actually said at this point, um, ladies, ladies, I think this is the first time I was ever surrounded by the enemy. <laughs> um, and Bell, Bell you know, had, was fascinated with him and obsessed with him. And she told reporters she wanted to, quote, occupy his tent and share his dangers. Um, and, and so she spent quite a bit of time um, going after that goal. So Bell had another, uh, another idol in her life, uh, Rose. Yes. And Rose is another one of the main characters, another key figure in the Confederate side of, the, uh, of, of this story. Talk a little bit about Rose. Well, Rose was a, an interesting woman who was in a very difficult position when the war broke out. Um, she had lost five children within four years. She had lost her husband in a freak accident. She lost her financial stability, and she lost her access to the White House. Um, in the 20 years prior to the war, she had had access to uh, Democratic politicians. She had actually been an advisor to President James Buchanan. Um, and so with the election of Lincoln, all of that disappeared. And she was desperate to regain this position, this um, you know, society, and this influence that she had wielded. And so when a Confederate captain approached her in the spring of 1861 and said, would you be interested in running a Confederate spy ring in Washington, D.C., the federal capital, uh, Rose disregarded the danger of that and said, of course. Um, of course I want to do that. Um, and she immediately began cultivating sources. Uh, by cultivating, I mean sleeping with. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and managed to bed quite a high number of high-ranking union officials, um, including Senator Henry Wilson of Massachusetts, who was an abolitionist Republican and the chairman of Lincoln's Committee on Military Affairs. Um, so you can imagine their pillow talk was quite interesting. <laughs> 
And she entertained these men in her home often. Oh, yes, yes. The neighbors watched her, watched the men come and go and called her Wild Rose. And it was a you know, rare, very, very catty situation going on. But Rose knew what she was doing and, and um, was very serious about her.